translation method. I, um, this uh, topic was my idea when uh, Stefano Vittori came and delivered a conference at uh, our Living Latin in New York City, uh, sorry, delivered a paper at our Living Latin in New York City conference, um, uh, I guess it was a year ago, or, or, or was it two? I can't remember, uh, a, a year and a half. Anyway, um, I saw that uh, uh, Stefano had developed this um, fascinating take on teaching Latin that was very grounded in linguistics. And since that time, we've been going back and forth um, discussing these observations, uh, which I felt were uh, really, really illuminating and um, uh, uh, quite literally paradigm shifting. And, and by that, I mean uh, the, 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 you know, paradigms of endings of, uh, of, of nouns and verbs, uh, which you'll hear about. So um, uh, that was why I thought it would be a good idea to do this talk. And then um, M Mark uh, Buckin and Jackie Myers, who are, who are two other talented uh, classicists involved with the Institute, uh, offered to participate in, in this panel discussion. So um, really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say about this fascinating topic. And I'm delighted that we've got um, 85 people on the Zoom. Uh, that must mean that uh, we've hit, we've touched a nerve um, somehow. Uh, and, um, and, and that's good because, uh, you know, we want to discuss topics that people are interested in and, and, you know, Latin pedagogy, classical language pedagogy, for some reason, people seem to attach uh, soteriological importance to it these days. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think, you know, because, um, we all understand that our discipline is under threat and everybody wants to teach things as well as possible, uh, to keep, to keep the thing going. So that, that's understandable. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, in, intro, introduce, uh, uh, Dr. Vittori. So, um, Stef Stefano has a uh, degree in Lettere Classiche from the University of Rome, uh, La Sapienza. He, he then uh, also has a master's degree in uh, Oriental Studies from uh, the University of Pisa, and then um, a PhD um, where he focused on Egyptology. So in addition to Greek and Latin, Stefano also knows uh, numerous other languages, including um, Sanskrit and uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, uh, but he works as a uh, professore uh, of, uh, cl of classical languages at a liceo classico in uh, the, the town of Latina. Um, so uh, that I think will be my introduction. Stefano is going to talk to us for 20 or 25 minutes or so about his approach. Then um, I'll ask Jackie and Mark uh, to respond and uh, then we'll open things up to questions, okay? So I'll ask, please hold your questions to the end. And uh, uh, also as a matter of Zoom etiquette, uh, which we're all very used to by this point, I, I, keep your microphone muted. But if you would, if you're decent, keep your camera on because it's it's much nicer uh, to talk to uh, people's smiling faces than just, you know, black squares. You sort of see like you're talking into the void. So mic's off, camera's on. And uh, thank you all for coming. And with that, I give you uh, Stefano Vittori. So hi, everyone. Uh, and hi, Jason, and thank you, uh, everyone, for coming, and to you, Jason, for uh, for this beautiful presentation. Uh, yes, I, uh, as you were saying, uh, I have st I have studied uh, various uh, languages in uh, in my university studies, but particularly I I have always been fascinated by uh, phonetics. 
linguistics, comparative linguistics, reconstruction uh, of phonetics uh, and ancient of uh, on phonetics of uh, ancient lang ancient languages, and uh, mm, then after after these university studies, um, I on one hand I kept on uh, teaching uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs in a private context uh, with some private schools. Uh, one time I also had uh, the pleasure to, to teach hieroglyphs uh, with Paideia uh, and, uh, and also I teach it in Italian, uh, ancient uh, Egyptian uh, in, uh, in a private school in Italy. But my main work has always been to teach adolescent uh, students in the public Italian school. And this because I am very fascinated by the way uh, an adolescent uh, boy or girl um, uh, acquires the, not some language, but the way how language work. And this um, method or um, let's say better this experiment arose from the fact from uh, from the observation i i made during my university studies that if i had been taught uh, some rules some phonetic rules which work between latin and italian my language acquisition of latin back then in the high school in high school would have been sensitively better uh, i i always say to myself when I was studied, studying, for example, uh, historical phonetics of, uh, of, of Italian in university, I always say to myself, why didn't my teacher explain this to me uh, when I was in, uh, in high school? This would have been, this would have made all, all way easier to Uh oh. <laughs> Let's see it's, if uh, it's oh, okay. There you go. Are you, are yeah, you 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 froze for a second. We 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 had we okay. you stopped out. This would have made everything way easier. This would have made everything everything easier. Also, I I, I said to myself, why, for example, uh, our teachers uh, do so rarely mm, connected. Latin with Indo-European and with other languages we we used to study, for example, with English and so on. So uh, when I came for the first time in the public Italian school, it was only natural for me to test these uh, observations of mine and so to revise the grammatical method. So basically we in the public Italian school have less room to uh, apply living methods, uh, conversational methods, because the uh, state wants at the end of the five years, the students to simply translate into Latin a classical text. And that's all. So you have to train them in this. You can also, of course, speak Latin, speak Greek. Uh, it's something I always do uh, every time I can but I have to uh, provide instruction and um, training in translation. So the grammatical, the traditional method can be left out uh, altogether and not be left out altogether for an Italian teacher. So I try to revise it, to modify it in a sense, which was the sense I would have liked in my, uh, in my high school years in a more linguistic uh, sense, in which uh, the, the mathematics of the language are explained. So less mnemonic, less memorization of uh, endings, uh, tenses, and, and so on, and more in-depth in -depth observation of the structure of the language. And for this, um, for this uh, goal, uh, I began with my students exactly with phonetic, with historical 
phonetics. So in uh, Italian, but also in Spanish, in uh, French, in all the uh, Neo-Latin languages, you have some rules, uh, a set of rules of phonetic transformation. And, and hence, you can, without a vocabulary, without a dictionary, if you know these rules, uh, if you know how consonants are transformed, how vowels are transformed, you can simply Italianize a Latin word or Latinize uh, back, uh, with a back engineering, Latinize an Italian word. And I trained my students in this kind uh, of exercises. So I explained them in the very beginning of the course uh, that, for example, a short E becomes A, a short U becomes O, like Kistam, which becomes Cesta, like Mundum, which becomes Mondo, and so on. And also explain them that uh, the Italian lexicon has undergone the influence of humanists after the Middle Age, and these humanists enriched the Italian lexicon sensitively with words, with Latin words, which had disappeared from the normal lexicon of, of normal people, and they artificially reintroduced these words. So these words, for example, non, do not uh, obey to the rules of the phonetic transformation. So I introduced them to the concept of what we in Italian call popularismo and cultismo. So natural, uh, organic, uh, inherent. Uh, if uh, can I can I share? Uh, I think I can. Okay. So, for example, this is a um, this is an, an exercise I uh, give to my students uh, at the beginning of of the year, where I provide some Latin words, and they have to transform them in uh, Italian words and so and also indicate whether they are natural inherited word popularismi or uh, artificial inherited words uh, cultismi and also we can see we can see in the at the end of the page two cases in which we have both the popular form the natural form and the the organic form and the uh, artificial form. So for example, Wigilium uh, by artificial way becomes Vigia and by popular way, by organic way becomes Veglia. Uh, Reum becomes Rio in a natural way and Reo in, a, in an artificial way. And the students has to uh, not only indicate which are the uh, inherited forms of Wigilium and Reo, and, and realm, but also indicate which one is the natural one, is the organic one, and which one is the um, is the artificial one. This um, okay. Uh, another exercise I I submit to my students. Uh, I take uh, a normal, a very famous Italian sentence. And I change a word, uh, making a word which actually doesn't exist, but it would exist if it had survived from Latin, applying the laws of the of the transformation of transformation. So uh, in this example, I take I take the very famous verses verse of Dante Alighieri, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, uh, so in the middle of the path of our life. And I replace cammin with ete, uh, nel mezzo dell'ete di nostra vita. The students, knowing that cammino, path, trip, travel is intended, has to, has to re remember that e in Italian uh, comes from either long e, like kenam, cena, or short e like kistam cesta so he has to look up in the dictionary and find a word which uh, begins with these sounds 
so he has to make scientific hypotheses, so to say, linguistic hypotheses, so to say, so to say, uh, which begins with these sounds and find the Latin word I have, uh, I, I have invented. Uh, in this case, the student reconstructed correctly ether from ete, from my uh, invented ete, because a short e becomes a, a t remains, stays t. Uh, an a, mm, a not stressed a remains a, and uh, any final consonant fall away, falls away in Italian. This had this kind of uh, this kind of place, this kind of uh, operation of mathematics, which have been proved very useful in translation. Uh, um, can can you hear me? The connection is is working. It cuts out. I for think so. Okay. So what? It cuts okay, out anyway. intermittently. Yes, and the, I, I, I'm having some little problems of, uh, of connection. Anyway, uh, this has uh, the skill uh, to reconstruct an Italian word from the Latin and, and vice versa uh, has given to, to my students some tools which have been proven very useful in translation without dictionary. For example, in this exercise, this is one of my students, I <clears throat> had given a text in Latin without the dictionary. The students meets this word city, it was an ablative, city, uh, which is the ablative of, of cities, thirst. And he, you see in the square, in the red square below, He knows that every every Italian word comes from an acute. Uh, every Italian noun comes from the Latin accusative. So he individuates the uh, the thematic vowel a. In this case, in this case, it would have been e. But it, of course, he he couldn't know because he had not a dictionary. So, but he correctly uh, understood the the declension, the third declension, uh, and then he isolated the root sit. And since there was no Macron on E, I pay um, a lot of attention. Of course, in this method, you have to pay a lot of attention on vowel duration, which is fundamental. In... So he reasoned, the E is short. So if this, if this word survived in Italian, it has to be sete, so thirst. And then he was able to translate without dictionary this sentence reasoning uh, another point of my method consists of uh, um, another way to explain the grammar so in um, uh, in latin in uh, the norm in, so in the traditional uh, grammar translation method you uh, simply uh, parse the word in root and ending but the teacher um, almost often, or almost always, or very often, fails to explain exactly to the students what an ending is. What is the boundary between the root and the ending? Or if the root is is the uh, is the only is the unique not more uh, a great piece of word, it's not root. And it conveys one sort of information, which is not true. So, for example, in a word like amawisemus, uh, the students uh, are told that am is the root and awisemus is the ending. Uh, but it's like if it's as if we uh, took a word like a, a construction like we would have loved, and we said that we would and we and we wrote it as a, a one sole word, we would have loved, and say that we would have, it's the beginning, not ending, of course, the beginning. And
the of loved is another way to convey the perfecting aspect. In Amavis Semus, we simply say to the student, okay, am um, is the root and avis semus is the ending. And you have to memorize a lot of endings and avisem, avises, averam, ave, uh, averint, and so on. While actually, if we analyze the real structure of the word, of the Latin word or of the Greek word, uh, we notice that the, the unique real difference between uh, an English construction like we would have loved and the Latin construction like amavis semus is that Latin doesn't separate the particles and English does. But the way a word is written should not uh, influence the way we analyze it. So I uh, train my students to not to simply memorize endings, set of morphs. For morph, I uh, mean a single atom of the word, like, for example, mus for we, or se in amawisemus, for example, they are trained to parse like that, mus, always from the end, mus for we, se for past subjunctive, is for perfective aspect, which is the same as er in amawe ramus. It's simply rotasis. Amawisamus uh, becomes amaweramus. It uh, amawisemus doesn't doesn't become amawersemus simply because the s it's not intervocalic. It, it's not between two vowels, so it's the same morph. This is another reason why I stress uh, phonetics so much because. Uh, if I teach the students the phonetic rules of transformation, not only from Latin to, English, uh, to Italian, but also from ancient Latin, from archaic Latin to classical Latin. So for example, an intervocalic S becomes R. Then the students understand that is in amawisemus and R in amaweramus is actually the same thing, one and the same. And it has not to memorize. It, he has to reason, not to memorize. So I uh, give them this kind of exercises. For example, uh, in, on the left, you can say you can see this way, and the students has to translate. In the right uh, side, it's the contrary. It's a Greek exercise. I provide the Italian form, and the students has to not only write the correct form in Greek, but also correct parse this form. I'm not content with the fact that you can say, uh, I don't know how to say in Greek, uh, they have to uh, solve Luonton. You have to be capable, you have to know how to explain me why Luonton means they have to solve that lu is to solve, that nt is they, that on is a command, and so on. Also, another important element is the, uh, the Sanskrit case order. So both in Italian and also in English, uh, we do have cases. Just we have only nominative and accusative. When teaching a language, you should um, you should start with the shared elements, the elements we are, which are shared by the language of the, uh, by the mother tongue of the learner and the target language. In our handbooks, you have always uh, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. Genitive and dative are not shared normally by Italian, but nominative, no, nominative and accusative are so for, with my students, I follow the Sanskrit order. The Sanskrit order is the order in which the nominative uh, and the accusative and the vocative are on top. And the uh, indirect cases, so ablative, dative, genitive are below. So I don't teach uh, single declensions in all the cases, but rather I teach all the declensions together 
but only in the direct cases. And then when the concept of case and declension is uh, strong in the student's mind, I go on on that on those cases which are not shared by the learner's mother tongue. Another important advantage of the Sanskrit case order is that the uh, homonymous cases, those cases which are equal to one another, are close to one another because in the neuter nouns, the nominative, vocative, and accusative are always the same. Uh, the ablative and the dative in some declensions are equal in the singular and in the plural are always equal in Latin, without exceptions. The genitive is the last case, also for uh, a matter of importance because it's, uh, it's more a nominal case than, uh, than uh, a, verbal, a verbal case. As for the, um, the verb, we are uh, trained in, in public schools, we are trained to focus on the tense, the verb tense, which is, of course, easy to understand for students. The problem is that the mood, con the concept of mood is always um, less explained. And usually I don't find students who can explain me with clear word what a mood is. Of course, the, the past, okay, the, the present is the present, it's now. The past is past, the future is future. Yeah, uh, uh, a student, uh, a very young student can understand what the tense is, what time is. But the mood concept. And it's important to teach them this concept from the very beginning, because this concept re uh, regulates a lot of content in the in the way a Indo, a Indo an Indo-European language works. Also, the mood helps the student to understand the concept of case because the mood is for the verb what the case is for the noun. The case is that particle, that slot of the noun, which allows us to understand that that noun is main, it's important, or is less important. It's the subject or not the subject. The same way, the mood is the element which allows us to understand that a sentence is main or is uh, uh, an underordinate sentence, uh, a clause uh, of lesser importance. This is something we understand through the mood. And instead, usually, uh, teachers, uh, at least in, in the schools where I work, explain the mood. The true fact, the subjunctive is a wish or something subjective. So, uh, this kind of concepts are difficult to understand by simple, abstract, but simple concept. The mood is what is for the verb what the case is for the noun, makes way clearer what is the mood and what is the case. So I explained to my students that a sentence, a period, is like uh, a solar system where uh, satellites, um, which are the nouns, orbitate around uh, planets, which are the, um, the secondary verbs. And these planets, orbitate around a star, which is the main verb. And you cannot give, you cannot provide this image of the analysis of a sentence with the tense or with the, or with the voice, active, passive, with other parameters of the verb. It's the mood. Make your students imagine sentence with this structure. Also, uh, a problem with uh, with our with with the grammatical and translation method in teaching Latin and Greek is the use of an ancient uh, terminology 
terminology which is which uh, arose before uh, the modern linguistics so for example you have terms like this terms in which uh, tense and aspect are merged like imperfect or perfect or blue perfect so more than perfect this kind of, of these names do not explain anything of the real nature of the of the verb you should i i try to to uh, um to train my students to understand that mood aspect and tense are and voice passive active and person are very well distinct parameters and the terms i use for these verbal forms are conse consequent to this analysis so lauda veramus it's not a pluperfect because this word doesn't mean anything it's it's a past perfect indicative so it's mood indicative aspect perfect tense past so the the action of uh, to praise laudare it's main because it's indicative it's accomplished because it, it's perfective we end we had ended to we had finished with praising back then and it's past uh, it's not a case that we focus uh, a lot of tense in in school but in the morphological chain of a latin verb the tense it's toward the end in lauda veramus you have loud which is the root a which is the conjugation and then you have u which is the narrative uh nuance always take away from the explanation of most teachers of uh, surely of all the teachers with uh, who i had back then in, in my high school of course this thing it's uh, uh it's uh it happens but also because uh, a terminology which is outdated and not scientific because it's a terminology which uh it has been created by ancient grammarians in the 4th, 5th, 6th uh, century AD, way before the modern study of linguistics arose. Then, of course, you have to uh, make so that the student actively uses the language. In my classroom, when we have an exam, uh, with translation from Latin to Italian or Greek to Italian, uh, it is possible, not mandatory, possible for the students to write a text in the target language, Greek or Latin. Uh, the errors they will make possibly uh, won't be, will not be punished, but if the text is good enough, so there is, there are not many errors, this will increase their, uh, their judgment, the, the result of the test. And this is an example of, this, uh, of the application of this method by a young girl of uh, 14 years in classroom without the dictionary. He wrote, uh, he translated from Greek to Italian the text I had given. And then he wrote uh, a text, a test, a text her own. Uh, simply um, using the words she knew and the grammatical reason, uh, reasoning. For example, we have some words which are very interesting. Uh, the form isen doesn't exist, but this was a first year, first year. And this kind of verb, the aorist, it's a... Uh, the, the, the aorist of, of a word of a word of a verb 
like uh, Amy, which doesn't exist, is something which is explained in the second year. Did explain the first aorist, the aorist in Sa. The, the, the girl can could not know that Amy, the verb to go, Amy, has no aorist of his own. You say Eben, so you use Bino. But she correctly reasoned and formed Isen, the blue word toward the end, Isen, which doesn't exist. But it would be like that if Amy had an aorist. So for me, as a teacher, the important thing is that the reasoning is correct. The word doesn't exist, of course, but the reasoning is correct. Then to this uh, girl, I had said, okay, the text is good, but you uh, you failed to put the spirits and the stresses. And she, uh, and she uh, brought to me this other text she had written at home with all the, the spirits and the stress, uh, right? So, uh, as a conclusion, um, I have noticed that using um, those which are thought to be uni university uh, content, university subjects, with very young students, allow them to deep to penetrate the rules of the language they are studying in a deeper way. And this conveys uh, an actual advantage. And this advantage, advantage is that the student is not forced to memorize, is induced to reason. The language should become something similar to mathematics and less similar to, I don't know, well, in all the subjects, there is a lot of reasoning, but like history as, uh, as mm, at least, as it uh, as it is taught in the school, so in which year this uh, this something like that. Uh, so the student, when he knows that he can reason and not simply memorize, it's um, is fascinated by the, by the subject. If he can play, so for example, not simply look up in a dictionary a word, but transform a word in another word, applying rules, applying theorems, this somehow awakes his mind. This awake, awakes uh, his passion for the language, because the language is not anymore a, a, a list of words to be memorized and a list of conjugations and declensions to be uh, played like a poem. It is a mathematical system. And this also provides an answer to all those who say, today, why is useful to study Latin and Greek uh, in, a, in, in a word? Kind of mathematics. We should also use Latin and Greek as a way to introduce linguistic to the students. Because of course you cannot, and I am concluding, you cannot teach general linguistic linguistics to a 14 years old girl or boy, but you can teach Latin and Greek to this, to this boy or to this girl and teach it in a way which is introductive, which is an introduction to general linguistics. Because then these boys and these girls uh, are going to study French, English, Spanish, and they will notice that uh, if uh, a short E becomes A in Italian, this is the rule in Italia, but then there is another rule in French and another rule in Spanish, but these rules are always internally coherent for each language. And so this kind of reasoning is very helping for them also to memorize the lexicon of the living languages, of the other living languages they study in the school. And I think that we have a...
uh, uh, do we uh, do I have time? I I think uh, I think uh, we are uh, over twenty five minutes. Uh, Jason, <laughs> did you? Uh, you are did you... you're slightly over you're slightly over time, Stefano. But I, I okay. it was so excellent. Okay. I, but that's it was, what, it was so this excellent. Is, uh, I could basically uh... what uh, I do with my students. So uh, I don't want to add. Uh, no, your... no. It was great. Can you can you uh, stop sharing your screen so we can all see each other? Yes. Uh, well, yes. Uh, I'm trying so, to. Yeah, that would. Yeah, see if you can. It'll let you. Um, and then in the meantime, I'll I'll I'll. Uh, there we go. Okay. Are. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that that was that was just fantastic. Um, I, I really think you. Um, you, you covered all of the most important points uh, really well. And um, I would, uh, at this point, I'd love to hear if, uh, you know, uh, Jackie and Mark's thoughts. Jackie, why don't we, th we start with you? Did, is there anything you want to say by way of a response to, to that? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jackie. Um, and uh, uh, just in case you didn't read my introduction, I was a Latin teacher for uh, over 20 years. I'm, I'm not teaching currently. Um, I, I'm an accountant now, but um, uh, but I was teaching as recently as, uh, you know, a few months ago. So uh, thank you very much, Stefano. That was uh, really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I have a couple of, you know, a couple of thoughts in sort of different directions here. And uh, one, I know you're teaching Latin and Greek to your Italian students. And so I'm I, I'm, yeah, I'm just curious about how your approach, you know, just hearing more about how your uh, phonetic approach uh, works. I can see it's very clear the, the relationship between Latin vocabulary and Italian vocabulary and how that uh, plays out. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious to hear more about how that works between languages that are less closely related than Latin and Italian, as of course, Greek would be, uh, would fall into that category. And um, and also, I think I'm probably like many uh, language teachers out there. You know, I have an interest in linguistic concepts and and a, a little bit of study of linguistics, but not a lot. And I'm wondering what recommendations you might have for those practicing teachers who um, you know who might find this kind of approach interesting, but don't have uh, you know don't already have that uh, background in the science of linguistics and how we might go about learning more so that we can uh, present that in a coherent way to students. So uh, those are just just a couple of my uh, first thoughts there because I, I can see how some of this information really would be interesting to many of my students. Of course, I have some who, who maybe, uh, uh, you know, who maybe wouldn't be as receptive, but, uh, but a lot who would. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Uh... They are both very interesting and very important questions. Um, it's special, especially the, the former, the first one. Uh, so of course, uh, this method has, uh, uh, has been proved um, so very well working with Italian students. But of course, there is, um, there is a connection, uh, a very tight connection between Latin and Italian, they are basically the same language uh, over time. Of course, you say, okay, uh, it's all fun and games, but if you have to teach English-speaking students, German-speaking students, how does it work? Well, for example, for example, uh, I have this problem, so to say, with um, when I uh, teach Greek, because of course, uh, there is uh, there is connection between Latin and Italian lexicon, a direct connection, but there is there is not such thing as a direct connection one to one word between Greek and Italian. It is just uh, it is just necessary to step behind in another level. So. For Italian, it's uh, easy, um, it's sufficient for me to step back to Latin. Between Italian and Greek, I have to, to step back to Indo-European. And the students study English in our schools, which is a Germanic language. 
with a lot of uh, Latin lexicon, of course, but it's a Germanic language. So when I teach Greek, uh, a lot of connections I do, I explain to my students, are with uh, uh, English. So uh, when the language is farther from the target language of the students, you have just to step back to another to another uh, level of the of the chain to another to another point of the chain so i focus when i when i teach greek i focus on uh, uh, both latin and english so for example uh, 10 in greek is deca that deca begins with the and that the is the same in Latin decem, but you have ten in English, and this means that an Indo-European the, when it comes to Germanic languages or at least to English, it becomes the, so it becomes voiceless, unvoiced, and this is a rule, and you can observe in other Greek words the same rule when you say that uh, the um, that the uh, corresponding English words uh, have uh, t or vice versa. Uh, uh, an, aspira an, an aspirated Indo-European consonant uh, becomes a voiced consonant in English. So when I teach to my students uh, the word tugater, daughter, I write on the, on the board tugater, and I, I write daughter. And they, of course, know what daughter is because they study English. And I, when I show them, look, in Greek, we have her, th, her. And in English, we have tugater, daughter. And look, and then I write, I put, I do, I create, t, te, me. And I, and I wrote he, which is the root, which is the root to do. And then I write do, English, under the he of titemi. So you see, I say to the, to the student, together, daughter, titemi, do. So this is a rule. And this is what can be done uh, between English and Latin, as I do between Greek and Italian. This is, this is a way you can uh, approach this uh, or apply this method for languages which are farther from Latin than Italian, Spanish, uh, uh, the, the Neo-Latin um, languages. As for um, in the second question, so linguistic uh, training, if I understood well, um, I- Yeah, which I, think, which I think you've sort of, uh, led into actually because you know for some of us we may not have the, all that background in uh, you know proto Indo European or Indo European roots right uh -huh. so so um, uh, yeah <laughs> yeah oh, well uh, one can study um, handbooks uh, in university handbook handbooks of reconstructive linguistics and more abstract with a more abstract uh, approach, but I personally love to, uh, I love the adolescent mind because it's concrete. Uh, and I prefer a concrete approach. So uh, I, I would suggest to start from a historical grammar of Latin and a historical grammar, grammar of Greek not a normal grammar, you have these handbooks, which are the historical grammars, which are not content with uh, content with uh, simply explaining what, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, how the second declension works, how the first declension works, the handbooks, which our students usually use in school. They are handbooks, um, usually um, studied in universities, uh, which explain the story of Latin grammar, of the story of Greek grammar, and also phonetics. Um, we have, uh, just to say, just to say the most famous name, we have Allens, Vox Latina, uh, Allens, Vox Graica, 
which very very well explains the the history of the phonetics of these languages. So um, it's uh, the, it's a study which can be sustained alone. Just you, you can uh, you can take this book from the net, from the internet, and study. And and you can, since you are you are a teacher, you uh, somehow know how to translate the university language in a language which is affordable for, uh, which is accessible for uh, for fourteen year human being. Uh, transforming the abstract into the concrete. So for example, when I uh, study an article uh, about uh, historical phonology, historical morphology, and I want to uh, and I want to bring it back to my students, I always depart from the examples, from the concrete things. because if I say to a class of 20 adolescents, uh, look, when uh, an uh, aspira aspirated plosive in Proto-Indo-European is transformed in Proto-Germanic and in uh, Greek. In Greek, it stays; it loses voicedness, and in Germanic, loses aspiratedness. It's maybe they, maybe maybe they will not understand something like that. If I wrote Sugater and daughter and Titemi and do, they with their, their eyes can easily understand what is going on there. The T is being replaced with a D. And it's a mathematical rule. So uh, I would suggest study historical grammars of ancient languages. Basically, Latin and Greek, if you are teaching Latin and Greek, of course, if you uh, it's better if you also study Sanskrit, if, if you also study Hittite or whatever. But it's uh, if you want to uh, teach Latin and Greek, it's, mm, it's sufficient to study historical grammars of Latin and Greek. And then the, 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 the most important part is when, it's when you translate this abstract concept for the mind of a 14, 15, 16 year old student. But this is a work which have, which which you have to do as a teacher. Thank you. Um, have I have I? That was an excellent answer. Yeah. Um, okay. That was a nice discussion, and some good stuff came up in the comments. I do want to draw draw people's attention to the link that was posted um, about this book, language files from the University of Ohio, which appears to be a uh, a popular oh, Ohio State. Ohio State, sorry, uh, uh, a popular introduction to linguistics that people might want to check out. Um, all right, uh, I, I want to pass now to uh, Mark Buchan and uh, sorry, uh, both of both Jackie and Mark for not giving you a more thorough introduction there. I was uh, um, sort of a little bit windblown <laughs> as I as I sort of slid uh, into this meeting right on time after a two hour car ride with my kids. So um, uh, Mark Buchan is um, uh, a classicist and editor of our online magazine in, in Medias Race and also a writing professor. So Mark, did you have something you wanted to say in response to Stefano? Sure, I'll keep it very brief, hopefully. Um, I think I wanted to separate two different aspects of what you've just told us. Um, the first one is the idea of um, a more scientific approach to teaching language and also a more active, a, a, an approach that both makes more logical sense and also creates more activity in the student, right? So um, I suppose, you know, back in the battle days when I, went last, when I learned Latin, there was so much past memorization, you want us to be involved. I love that. And I think that you can even see ways in which um, you could adapt current test textbooks, say, to fit in with your ideas. So just to give like an obvious example, the um, almost every English textbook that teaches Latin now will have um, related words in English and Latin. So you learn ammo and then you find out it's got something to do with amateur, right? Um, and you remember it that way, but you're suggesting we could go a step further, right? And suggest, uh, give to the students some kind of historical uh, way of getting from one to the other much easier in Italian than in English, but it, like it's possible, right? So I could, so I, all of that I like. But the second thing, um, uh, so that's one part of it, right? A scientific approach to teaching. And in principle, 
you don't really need to know much linguistics to, to answer, um, to, to be able to do that, right? You could just follow the rules in the textbook or send students to that. But the second one is a kind of a deeper level, right? And it's um, uh, how much, am, should we be teaching classics with a view to learning linguistics? You kind of said that at the end, but I, I think that's very interesting. Um, and I mention this because this is something that classics seems to me is very good at. Um, and I'll, I'll give IMR a plug on this. Um, if you, um, an, an ex student of mine, Dan Walden, wrote an article about why classics. And he talked about his experience in grad school as being this kind of intellectual potpourri of one door you have the classicist who's a linguist, the next door you have the historian, the next door you have the literary critic, right? So you can just add all of these things to classics. So my question for you would be something like, I can imagine um, whoever taught Latin in that department, if you got the historian or if you got the um, literary, if you got me, uh, a lot of the time would be spent doing kind of literary critical stuff, even at the very basic level. Uh, you know, I, I would spend more time on poetry. I would tell them how poems work and try to help them appreciate it. But if a linguist teaches it, it's going to be more heavily, um, to, uh, it's going to be more interesting uh, linguistic stuff, right? Um, so um, is this like, how do you balance the two, the kind of science of using modern linguistic approaches to teach better versus the idea of we can use classics to give you an intro to how basic ling uh, linguistics work or how historians work or how maybe we should have different Latin one, ba baby Latin classes where people teach it in different ways. So I just wanted to throw that as an, as an idea. Thank you, Mark. Stefano, do you want to respond to that? Okay, of course. Um, if I, uh, I I just want to make sure um, I I have understood correctly the the the, the question. Um, so how we can balance the uh, more the scientific aspect, uh, mm -hmm. which is very technical with vowels uh, transforming mm -hmm. and consonants and plosives and and so on, with the uh, more humanistic aspect, uh, uh, literary critics, and mm -hmm. this uh, uh, ha have yeah. I understood? Okay. Yeah. So if you if you taught Latin, I bet you'll be more emphasizing the linguistic aspects of it. I mean, mm -hmm. this is very exciting, right? You don't just learn Latin; you learn how languages work when you take your yes. class, right? This is the this in a much deeper goal. way than than, than mine. Mm. So. Well, uh, as for the. Mm, so, so you are uh, so you are asking how to um, balance the mathematical aspect and the humanistic aspect. Basically, this is the yeah, the, the core and the the, liter the literary aspect. Yeah. Well, uh, in an anthropological way. So uh, I, I I I say to my student that linguists are uh, actually part of the of the family of the anthropologists. Linguistics is actually part of anthropology. For an anthropologist, it's not more important, of course, for a for, for a historian of, uh, um, of of yes of literature. Um, Cicero and Horace are more important than uh, I don't know a lawyer who, who writes down a contract. But for an anthropologist, they are not on the same level, of course, but they are at the same level of importance with the aim uh, in the aim of discovering a culture and a way of and a type and a type of civilization so when i explain when i explain forms i treat i um, i use the authors as inform as uh, informal I, I i don't know if this if this is the correct english word in italian we say informatore so an, an italian anthropologist would say uh, if i go in a tribe in an african tribe i have an informer whom i can ask about the way the tribe works so horace and cicero and of course plato aristoteles and so on in greek are are our informers and so the examples I use in class are always taken by authors. And I try to choose those examples whose meaning, whose content, it's most understandable and also likable by 
a boy, a girl of that age. In this way, while their brains reason about linguistics, the concepts conveyed by the authors silently are acquired by their minds. And they, um, curiously, remember very well the meaning of the sentences of uh, Atullus, of Cicero, of Marshall, uh, which I use, because they have reasoned on their sentences. So also from the viewpoint of literary critics and literary history, the reasoning on the word allows the student to better understand the author, also from a literary viewpoint. Of course, you have to choose the right example. So you touched a topic very important to me, which is choose the right authors and in the right authors choose the right sentences. Those sentences which are not which are not too abstract, too abstruse, uh, um, but which can be uh, understood, also not easily understood because, because also the student has to reason. So also on the meaning. So they have not be trivial sentences in the way around. They have to be beautiful sentences which convey the spirit, the thought of the of the author. And also, it's a little bit difficult. And also, they have to have all those grammatical and linguistical features you want to explain. Um, so it's a little bit difficult, and you have to uh, devote some time to this to, to to find these examples. But then, when they from the first two years, in which they only study grammar, pass to the last three years, in which they study both grammar and literature, all, this, all that literature they studied while studying grammar is well founded in their minds uh, because they studied it linguistically and morphologically. So yes, I, I, uh, I submitted to my students also Hesiod, Hesiod Homer, um, Catullus, uh, of course, of course. Simple sentence, but I but I did. So yes, no linguistic also in this sense can can be helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I think we, if people want to hang out, uh, we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone have any? You can uh, just unmute yourself and talk or uh, write it in the comments if you prefer. Um, Stefano, uh, while people are thinking, I'll just say um, one of the, uh, Becca, I see you there. Uh, you can go next. Um, one of the uh, parts of your talk that I found really fascinating while I was reading it in preparation for this event is this idea of a sort of um, antiquated lexicon for Latin grammar um, and these kind of, um, you, 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 we're going to eventually publish some of what Stefano put together as an article. And there's a funny bit in there about the pluperfect, the, plu, the plus quam perfect um, as a sort of terminological. Wonder, the wonderful tense. Yeah. Plus as a sort of terminological mons monster. Um, yeah. How could we understand uh, better the process of the development of this nomenclature, you know, even, even if it is um, incorrect scientifically? I mean, it's it's exerted a tremendous cultural force. Um, so I'd be yes. curious to, to be able to understand the process of the development of that nomenclature better. Well, uh, the, the, the basic problem is that the ancient grammarians didn't understand the difference between tense and aspect. So the concept of time and the concept of aspect. So originally, in a so, so to say, in a normal nomen nomenclature, uh, you would you will have, um, let's say, the indicative, 
okay? You will have two aspects. If we are speaking about Latin, because Greek uh, has a lot of more aspects, um, Egyptian has a lot of more more aspects. But in Latin, you you have basically imperfect. So I'm doing and perfect. So I've done. Um, and then you should have also the aorist. I did, but the Latin conflates, the, the Latin system conflates the aorist I did with the perfect I have done. Conflates uh, epraxa and pepraka. So we have imperfect and perfect. And then you have tense. The tense uh, follows the aspect. So you have imperfect present, fuck you. Imperfect past, fakiebam, and then you have perfect present, feki, and perfect past, fekeram, and then of course you have imperfect future, uh, fakiam, and perfect future, fekero. But uh, something strange has happened because fakio, laudo, amo. Amo, it's imperfect present. And then the grammarians become simply, begin simply to say the present. But it's not a present, it's an imperfect present. Amo, I'm loving. Amo. Then for the past, imperfect past, amabam, amabam, one should think, okay, so if imperfect present becomes present, amo, imperfect past, amabam, should become simply past. But not, because if you call amabam simply past, then amawi, which is both present perfect and uh, past aorist, what is because let the, the, the Latin people, Latin speakers, don't uh, distinguish between I did and I have done. So they use feki, amawi, both for I have loved and for I loved, both for uh, egapeka and egapesa. So you cannot uh, call the imperfect past simply past, because in that case, amawi, which is at the same time, perfect past and an aorist, uh, um, um, excuse me, uh, a perfect present and an aorist past becomes another past and we have two pasts and this is a problem. And so for the imperfect present, they, take, uh, they took away the aspect. The aspect doesn't matter, it's a present because we don't have more than one present. We have only one present, amo. So it's the present. For amabam, it's not a past because we actually have that other voice, which is that other form, which is a present actually, but also a past, but under another point of view. So amabam becomes simply an imperfect. And in this, and in this case, and in this case, the imperfect, so the the the, the aspect, it's important, and the tense goes away. So past dies out and it's only imperfect. Then you have amawi and it is a, pre a perfect present. But the, if amabam is an imperfect, so amawi is perfect, only the past. And since the, ten and since the tense has been thrown away, thrown away, when you have the perfect past, amaweram, how do you call it? Okay, amawi is perfect, which means I've, I I I am finished with uh, with loving. Uh, I don't love anymore. Amawi, and amaweram, it's more than finished because I'm not finished now. I finished before, so it's like it. Uh, as time passes, you all uh, you finish and finish more and more. Of course, it's it's an absurdity. It's a logical absurdity. If you have finished to do something, you are finished. And that's all. You are not more finished there than, than, than before, of course. But this is this is the um, way it happened. So uh, amo 
only present, amabam, so only the tense, amabam, only the aspect, and as a result, now the students cannot understand what is an aspect and what a, a tense is, and which is the difference between these two, these two concepts. Of course, one is not, um, um, I'm not scolding the, the, the ancient grammarians in this linguistics didn't, uh, hadn't been brought to light. But the fact that now, after 200 years of linguistics, we still use the, the terms of 1,500 1, years ago, as if we, in physics, we're speaking about ether or something like that, uh, that that is a problem. That is a problem. But the way this terminology arose is very impressionistic because it was pre-scientific. So, for example, why nominative and then genitive and then dative and then accusative? While it's so simple how Panini, how the Indian grammars do, and they. So, for example, if you uh, um, if you compare the nominative and the accusative, lupu, s, lupu, m. It's so clear. S means subject and m means object. It's okay, and it's perfect. Why lupus and then lupi, which takes away the, voca the thematic vowel and prevents the student to understand which is the, uh, the, vo the vocalic vowel, uh, the thematic vowel, and hence, which is the declension, the nominal class, and then the dative, and then the and then and only then the accusative. So we are forced, or our students in classroom are forced to uh, to declinate a, a neuter noun, for example, uh, kilium, kili, kilio, again kilium, again kilium, and then again kilio. While we could say kilium, kilio, kili, three words, not six or seven. I don't know. Um, why this? Because the genitive in Greek, so all uh, arises in, in Greece. So the grammar study arises in Greece and uh, the genitive, uh, the Greek language has no ablative. So in uh, um, the genitive, the nominative is of course important because it's the subject. The genitive in the second position because uh, it's the, um, it works as an ablative in Greek. So uh, if I come from the sea, Ercomai apo tes thalasses, and the and the starting point is more important than the arriving point. So the starting point is in the second position. Dative is the um, is the um, locative in Greek. Uh, I am in the sea. Egoimi entei thalasse. So I depart genitive. I stay dative. But if I am going through to the sea. Ego baino eis ten talasan, so with accusative. So this, you see that this is completely absurd and has nothing to do with the way one should learn a language because it's it's simply an impressionistic way to list the cases. The Indian grammarians sim simply uh, observed that some cases are equal to other and some others are not, and they simply say, okay, let's uh arrange these cases in a way that all the equal cases or the homonym homonymic case are close to one another which is something more a little bit more analytic and and working than saying okay uh, let's put the genitive in second position because it's the departing point because i say a protest alasses and things like that of course but thank you and thank the grammarian and the indian grammarians were uh, contemporary contemporary to the greek one so Thank you. It's not uh, a question of time. I want to get to Becca, who's been wait, waiting patiently, and then Perry. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I would like to apologize if you hear any noises. There was an important football match here in Georgia, which you apparently won. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vittori, for your um, wonderful speech. I really like the emphasis on linguistics because for some reason it seems that we try to simplify things by not bringing linguistics into the class and by um, forcing, almost forcing students to memorize a lot of rules when they can actually memorize some basic rules and then just figure out all the rest themselves. Now, uh, I actually have 
two questions. The first is, how do we deal with the problem of semantics? Because you mentioned that we can use phonetics to see which Italian word derives from which Latin word, for example. But uh, when time passes, the words change meaning. So I think there is still need for a dictionary perhaps here to not make a semantic mistake. This would be my first question. And the second okay. would be, you've already mentioned some books which uh, teachers can use to get some basic knowledge about linguistics and to apply it uh, during their lessons. But uh, how about the students? Are there any books, uh, perhaps simplified books, which students can use um, and which uh, the books which apply this approach, linguistic approach, to um, the languages uh, Greek and Latin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the first uh, the first topic you you touched. So um, they are um, non perfunctorie. Uh, if I can speak uh, a little of Latin, two wonderful questions. Um, and th and also I want to underline something you said in the introduction. It's true. Mm, a lot of teachers say, oh, why linguistics? They, ha they are uh, students, they are 14 years old students. You make it way more complex for them. It's not true. It's way more complex to memorize, to stupidly memorize uh, tones of endings than to reason uh, a 14 years old student can easily reason. It's, it's less easy to memorize for each form, for each word, a lot of forms which are not understood, which are not deeply understood. So it's a question, it's, it's a question of where to put the effort. Uh, the, the, the effort Many people think that it's easier to put the effort in brutal memorization, and that's not true. Uh, the effort must be there. Nobody's saying that studying Latin, Greek, and ancient languages is easy. It takes an effort, but it's important to understand where we put this effort. Actually, uh, the effort, every effort which makes so, that a student is a passive element of the lesson is to be avoided. So memorization, which is passive, because I simply have to bring words with my man, mind and repeat them, this is passive and this is to be avoided. If I make so that the student can play with rules and theorems, in this case, the student is an active element, which has to make hypothesis about a world and his and its history and this makes him an active part of the process so this is uh i want to under to, to underline this part of your question which is very important to me then uh coming to answer your question the semantics are an element uh very interesting so i approach the question in this way in the first year for me, it's very, very important that the student understands the morphological, syntactical, and phonological processes of the language. For this reason, in the text, I try to avoid as much as possible words which have undergone too significant change of meaning. In this way, the student's mind can concentrate on the most important part, which is the, un the understanding of the structure of the, uh, of the language. But already since the first year, um, let's say the middle of the first year, I begin to introduce uh, false friends and words which have changed their meaning over time. The way I approach this, um, this phenomenon, so the semantic shift uh, the semantic shift is you always have to explain why you hold you always have um you always have to explain why a word changed its meaning 
so in, also in this case, it's not the dictionary. It's not the dictionary which solves the, the problem. Uh, you begin by inserting one word, two words, four words, which shifted in meaning. And you explain that. Why this meaning has shifted? Why uh, casa in classical Latin used to mean uh, shelter, uh, or, um, and, and in class in, in in Italian means home. Why we don't use uh, domus? And then I ask my student, do we really not use domus? Transform me, transform for me, please. Domum, the accusative, in an Italian word, applying the rules. And they come up with Duomo, which is actually a big church. So the house of God. And, and I try to approach the semantic shift in this way, because usually the semantic shift is also history of culture. But has to be explained. I'm not content with the fact that simply you open a, a dictionary and say, ah, OK, casa, it's not actually home, it's uh, shelter. Um, that, 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 that is mnemonic. Uh, it's mnemonic. And doesn't, I want to uh, link, me, link myself with the previous question, the uh, humanistic aspect, the literary aspect. Reasoning on the history of uh, meanings of words opens on the history of culture. And to and takes to better understanding of that culture. So yes, uh, the shift, the, the 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 semantic shift, I approach it in a second moment, of course, but I do approach it, and in a in a way which is similar uh, to the way I approach the phonetic aspect. So I, of course, uh, explain the transformation. The difference, of course, is that if that while. We, so the linguists, have been able to invent an uh, international phonetic alphabet. Uh, the semiologists, uh, alas, weren't able to invent an international semantic alphabet. So in other words, you can foretell the transformation of a word if you know the rules. You cannot foretell the transformation Sem the semantic transformation of a word, the transformation of a meaning can be foretold. Uh, so it's not a scientific uh, subject in the sense that it's not repeatable and uh, subject to the experimental uh, laws. So of course my approach must be a little bit different, but the, the, the question, the, the main point is nothing can be delivered in in a mnemonic and reason and reasonless way, every explanation to the students must be reasoned, and uh, he has to be an active part of this explanation. Uh, as in, like in the case of domus and casa, where the student actively must uh, apply the phonetic rules to discover that actually domus still exists in Italian, but it's not simply a home. As for the um, second question, which is uh, a very important question too. Uh, so are there books with this kind of subjects, but uh, so to say uh, adapted for, uh, for students of that uh, age range, of the range of age? Um, well, uh, in some of our, textbooks in school, in the Italian public school. Um, I, I could tell the name of the titles of these books, but I, it's they are Italian high school books. I don't think it's useful for anyone out there. But then, then there are little chapters, little footnotes about these subjects. Of course, the teacher skips, skips them every, every time. But also, it's um, it's easy to skip these parts because they are footnotes, um, something which in Italian is called approfondimento, uh, like uh, as if as if it as if as if it was a subject for curious people and nerds who want to.
um, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know a book which for stu for adolescent uh, students, with, of course, for universitarian students, of course, I know it, books uh, like that. But for uh, high school students, I don't know a book which structures all the lessons in a historical linguistic uh, way. So for, to apply this method with the students today, uh, one should do basically what I did. So simply use university books, as I was saying uh, to Jack uh, formerly, and you are the book. So you are the translator from the university book to the adolescent ears who hear you, who, who listen to you. Um, in this sense, one can say that the teacher is a simplifier. It's not a simplifier in the sense that it, uh, it takes uh, an abstract and difficult subject and brutalizes it, uh, making it simply a mnemonical subject. But rather, it's something who studied in university, approached university subject, and studies how to transform this concept in co into concepts which can be understood by those minds, which are, of course, each one different from one another. We, uh, we tend to simplify the thing, the, the adolescents, as, they were, as if they were one person. Of course, there are several kinds of adolescents, and... And this is also the reason why my use of the textbook in classroom, it's, uh, it's not so high. Uh, I, use, I mainly use material written by me, exercises written by me, which we correct in classroom, but mainly they have to write. My students have to write a lot. I want them to be familiarized with the pen, with the, with the paper, with the necessity of hearing um, what uh, is being said. I prefer them to buy a book by Catullus, by Virgil, by Cicero, uh, and then for the grammar to relate to the articles and the material I, I provide them, uh, then spend a lot of money in textbooks, uh, which of course have this kind of method, which for me is un unsatisfying, and this is also the reason why. I don't use a textbook. Of course, if uh, such a textbook existed, uh, I would use it. But then I, in this case, I would have needed to write all the material I used in, in these years. So to sum up, I don't think, I don't think that this kind of books, as, at least as I have them in my mind, exist, or at least I never seen, I never saw. One of uh, one of them, maybe in America, maybe in other countries, it's uh, it's different. But in our country, the textbook for uh, for students in high school um, have some footnotes about historical grammar and that sort. Okay, thank you, um, Harry. I I want to get to you. Did Did you have one last question? I think this is going to be the last one. Me or? Yes, oh. you you you, Perry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh I wanted to get your thoughts, Stefano, on going from the modern Greek to the classical Greek. Okay. As you know, there's this emphasis on Erasmian, and there are the 10 million people in Greece who are exposed to classical Greek in high school with the, mainly the Greek pronunciation. The and modern on, Greek pronunciation, of yeah, course. And on that point, Vice versa, there are classical speakers or st students who want to learn modern. And what is your thoughts on that approach? My experience is with classical friends that maneuvering in Athens have difficulty ordering a meal or a cup of coffee because with the classical Greek, they really have not learned the modern Greek. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on, if you know modern Greek, learning the classical Greek? Um, using your method or is there a simpler way? Well, if I, uh, if I 
if I were a, a teacher in Greece, well, this is we have the, we have a very similar problem in Italy because of course we have the problem, which is not of course a problem the way around. It's very beautiful. We basically speak the same language, uh, but after some centuries. So the prob the 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 bad aspect, the bad the the bad side of this situation is that people is not linguistically trained. And one of the consequences of not being linguistically trained is to be aware of the fact that the phonology of a language, that, that the phonology is a part of the language. So the language has lexicon, have morphosyntactic, and, and the phon phonetics. And all these three layers change over time. So for some reason, people easily understand that the grammar changes over time. Today we say um, il lupo, and 2,000 years ago we, we were saying lupus or lupum, whether it was subject or object, and today we say simply lupo, and that's not a problem anymore for us. Mm -hmm. You, in Greece, you say, of course, olikos, toliko, but you don't say anymore toi lukoi or toliko, uh, except for some expressions like doxa toteo, um, where you have still this dative uh, paradigma toscari or this kind of um, this kind of frozen expressions. So uh, everyone understands that grammars the grammar changes over time. Also lexicon, you used to say selene, and now you say fengari. Um, so lexicon changes, and you see, you see that the lexicon change. But phonetics is a part of the language, and in language change, all the language, the whole language changes, also the phonetics. But this is something difficult to understand, to be understood by people, because you read the words, and unfortunately, the written systems of the languages change way more slowly than the phonetic system of those languages. For example, the English speaker, speakers uh, speak modern English, but write their language as if it were as if it was the language they uh, their fathers used to speak uh, five, six, seven hundred year, years ago. Uh, so you pronounce green, but you write Graham, as you used to pronounce it uh, 700 years uh, ago. Um, but it's, it, this is normal because the, the written system is a, com is a social convention. So it's, more, it's easier for us sim to simply maintain that previous social convention and uh, going on pronouncing differently. Yeah, it's like it's uh, as if you had a photograph of yourself when you were six year old, seven years old, and you still presented this photograph to the policeman when he uh, when he asks for the documents. So. Englishman uh, pronounce Shakespeare uh, or um, Beowulf as if it was uh, a contemporary author. Author, so it's a problem of all the language of the literary and ancient languages. In uh, Greek, it, uh, the case is to um, uh, is to explain. I explain to my students in Greek that the the phonetic has changed and the pronunciation. I teach both pronunciation to to answer more concretely to answer to your question. I personally teach both pronunciation. I want to uh, hear them pronounce in classical Greek from fifth century before Christ. If, if we are reading uh, Plato, if we are reading Aristophanes, and if we are reading Cavathis, uh, if we are reading Rizos, I want them to pronounce, of course, in modern pronunciation. So I, I try to teach them that the, uh, the one of the one of the 
many beautiful aspect, aspects of the linguist of linguistics and of languages in general. It's their capability of changing as if they were bi biological systems. So it's something mathematic. It's mathematics, but with blood. I don't I don't know how to say it. it's mathematics. It's living mathematics with change. So. Uh, that's not something like a bad, um, a right pronunciation or wrong pronunciation. There are not absolute concepts. Uh, uh, a modern Greek pronunciation is, of course, wrong if you use it to pronounce uh, Aristophanes, uh, to read Aristophanes. And it's, of course, right if you use it to read Cavafis and Rizzos. Uh, so the, the, the students have to learn both pronunciation and use them uh, when in, in the situation where they are uh, required. And this is, of course, more difficult, but it's also more beautiful. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> I think uh, oh, do, I, I was going to close things. Do you have an, a question you want to ask, John? Or well, I was just going to say that I've enjoyed this greatly. I'm very impressed with the distinctions. He's making me, I have loved what I've got, you see. It's making me rethink my introduction to Latin that I'm doing with, with an advanced student. I realize that one of the things that we could use as activating his thought is to get him think more about the uh, about the dactyls and the spondies. So uh, metrics is one thing you can do to activate the student. I think your concept of activating is excellent. And I just thought that metrics might be used in that way too. Mm, or, um, in, so uh, you touched the, mm, the, the, all these questions. Uh, all these questions are touching uh, my favorite uh, topics. This is um, this is fantastic. So, uh, well, uh, I personally write me metrics, uh, write texts uh, in metrics. I um, I begin, um, apart from that, I begin the study of um, I begin my courses with phonetics, and this means that one of the most important parts of my course is the phonetic part, as I was saying at the beginning. Of course, I, if I want to, to, to teach you that um, uh, long A in Italian becomes A and a short A in Italian becomes A, it's very important that you as a student, as a student, when pronounce the word K -E -N -A, you pronounce K -E -N -A. And when you pronounce when it, you have to pronounce when it and not when it. So uh, the metrics, which is something I teach in the second year, um, it's something you have to, you have to arrive, you have to reach metrics once you already pronounce correctly the short and the long vowels. And then metrics is, and then metrics is simply reading. Um, so metrics is a part, it's an important part of the language, but if you teach metrics and the student has not understood what a long vowel and what a short vowel is and why languages have short and long vowels, what are they generally, then metrics will be simply a, a song you have to like, a jingle, a jingle, you have to tam ta ta tam ta ta tam ta ta and that's completely it's not beautiful and it's not useful. It's beautiful and it's useful if you take these students in a travel in, in this travel in this language which has these characteristics different from our languages because you know there are these long and short vowels, but but also they are not so different as characteristics because also in Italian we do have not long and short vowels, but we do have long and short consonants. And as, well, um, as I was saying formerly, uh, you have to start from what is shared by the two language to take the students to what is not shared. So for example, uh, phonetic, 
phonetic length is shared by Latin and Italian. The only difference is that Latin has it in both consonants and vowels, while Italian has it only in consonants. Um, also, I am from Rome, and I teach in the Roman in the Roman region and in the Roman dialect. We do have secondary phonemic distinction. So, for example, da Roma means from Rome, and da Roma means of the of Roma football uh, league. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So da means from, and da means of the. So we do have it. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I always make this kind of examples to my students to make them understand that these things which can look like strange things are not so stranger and are not so strange. Um, and then when you come to metrics, it's simply that same thing which all of a sudden becomes music. And that's uh, Jason, that's... I would say that I think uh, Stefano Vittori is the smartest kid on the block, and it's a privilege <laughs> to be able to talk with him. It seems likely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You should hear him. See, he could have done this whole lecture in Latin, too, if he wanted to, and it would have been, uh, I think, probably even more fluent and impressive than his already fluent and impressive English. So uh, <laughs> I agree with you. That my English is uh, fluent and impressive. Okay, I, I take it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, there's still 48 of you here, amazingly, after an hour and 45 minutes, uh, which must mean that, uh, you know, we found um, the group who likes to hang out and talk about vowel quantity, um, uh, of which I confess that I'm also, also a member. Um, but thank you again to Stefano, uh, for everyone for coming. You know, I am sitting here with my wheels turning and thinking that we probably should try to put together some kind of, um, I mean, we're already planning on publishing something about Stefano's method, uh, you know, short article online, but uh, I think, uh, you know, an online course might not be a bad idea as well. Something like, you know, ling linguistics for classicists or something like that. So we'll, we'll think about this. That Stefano, would be very, very beautiful. Stefano definitely has a lot to offer and uh, it's wonderful to have him in our community uh, as it is to have all of you. So thank you for coming. Have a great rest of your day and weekend. Thank you again to Jackie and Mark um, for uh, being involved with this. And um, Ace Husteron. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank thank you. Bye. It was a thank honor. You. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.